Thank you for listening to the Ask AI podcast. To get our latest episodes, AI news, discount codes for events, and links to free resources, sign up to our monthly newsletter by visiting askai.org and clicking the subscribe link. That's askai.org. Hello, Melissa Karjanak is here for another episode of the Ask AI podcast. This episode features Dr. Joelle Pinot, a vice president of AI research at Meta and concurrently a professor at McGill University. We had a wonderful conversation touching on everything from two major mysteries of AI and, of course, regulation, diversity, big topic items. And she shares some really interesting perspectives on the work that FAIR, the research lab, at Meta has done over the last six years that she's been there. Join us. This episode is sponsored by Sinchi. Sinchi is the enterprise data collaboration platform that enables people, systems, and AI to co-produce intelligent, reusable data products in real time. By eliminating data integration from IT delivery, Sinchi also makes it virtually impossible to violate data protection controls as you leverage AI technology for your business. If you are an enterprise IT leader looking to de-risk and accelerate your AI journey, this is what you've been looking for. Visit Cinchi.com to learn more. Joelle, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Happy to be here. We're going to be talking primarily about FAIR, which is the Facebook AI research group. And then looking at, you know, AI research as a whole and certainly how this relates to the Canadian system, which is critically important and why this podcast exists. But I'd love, you know, if we start just to tell us a little bit about you and why AI and, you know, you have a PhD in robotics. When, when did the AI part come in or, or certainly it's a part of it, but tell, tell us more. Sure. Happy to. Um, I'm Canadian born. I, I was, uh, grew up in Ottawa and and honestly, I came to AI quite quite late. Um, you know, I had a deep interest in all sorts of other things, music, sports, all sorts of other things as growing up. But but I was always fascinated by um, math and science and and the ability to use math and science to solve real world problems. And so that led me to studying engineering at the University of Waterloo. And in and, and my very last year there, I was studying systems design engineering, you know, broad, integrative. Um, I, I got just pulled into a project on robotics, building a six-legged robot. Um, and, and in particular, the sonar system, so the robot could see the obstacles around it and use that to, to, to guide it. Um, and, and I had a chance last uh, spring to go back to University of Waterloo and, and you know, talk to my, my undergrad thesis supervisor and the robot is still sitting there on a shelf. That was a wonderful moment. Um, but really what drew me into this first project and to this day, what keeps me there is really curiosity. Uh, I'm, I'm just really keen to learn more, to understand. Um, and, and I found that in AI, you have the ability to solve problems. You know, we talked about healthcare, robotics, all these things, solve problems of so many different types um, with a pretty powerful technology that we are still developing, that we are still trying to understand. And, and that, that's just captivated me now for, for a few decades. I mean, absolutely. You can see even on your uh, Wikipedia and Google Scholar and Facebook Scholar pages, you know, it looks like you were first author, oh my goodness, like 2000, or you were second author on something in 2000. Is that your first major publication? Uh, it's my first major publication in AI, uh, which is on dialogue systems, um, the use of reinforcement learning systems for dialogue system. We were pioneer in the day and, and you know, fast forward. At 23 years, and we are here all about reinforcement learning for uh, <laughs> GPT family of models. So, uh, yes, but before that, I had a couple papers uh, from the research internship on evacuation patterns uh, for fire safety out of high rise buildings. <laughs> I what? was trying to be a researcher, but you know, sometimes you take a few paths before you land in the right research area. Um, so, that was from a summer job in my undergrad. But yes, my first paper in AI 2000. Yes. Wow. Well, very cool. See, there you go. So on this show, you know, 
I really do try to keep it as simple as possible. And I know you're an absolutely brilliant researcher. So hopefully as you're answering, we can try to um, keep it uh, something that people who are maybe like interested in AI, but don't necessarily work in the field, something that they can really grasp, um, which I'm, I'm sure with all your brilliance would be able to do. So let's start with there, the Facebook AI research group, you know, and, and your role in that group and what is like the purpose, the goal, like what are you, tr what are you trying to do? And certainly for our listeners who want to understand that interplay with Facebook and, and AI research specifically. Um, I, I joined, uh, you know, the company we now call Meta um, back in 2017. And, and I joined this, this organization called FAIR. At the time, we called it Facebook AI Research. Now we actually call it Fundamental AI Research because the company changed its name. So we had to, you know, really <laughs> capture what we're doing. But, but still, it, it's a group that is dedicated essentially to solving fundamental problems in AI. And so that's something that people may not be, be used to, but, but the number of, of large companies have a group that is dedicated to essentially solving the most fundamental problems, problems such as, you know, how do we build models to understand perception, to understand what we see, what we hear? How do we build models that can be used for planning and reasoning? And so they have the ability to take information, but then use that information in a way to produce, produce plans, to produce decisions, and, and to draw logical conclusions. We have a, a part of our activities that are looking at the interaction between AI and the physical world. So things like robotics and embodiment. Um, incredibly interesting to see if you build a system to reason about the world and you do it sort of with the, the, the web versus with the physical world, there's a different set of problems that come about. And, and so we have sort of all these different research areas, but, but the core goal is to advance machine intelligence. Uh, by solving the mysteries of AI and to do it with a combination of um, a deep scientific approach and engineering approach um, as well. Brilliant. And, and, you know, of course, with your six-legged robot back in the day, uh, uh, you know, which I'd love to see, by the way, um, a picture of, you know, that physical AI and robotics. It's so interesting. It must be a huge area that you have this ongoing many, many years of experience in the physical side as much as the web side. What are some of those, like to put a name on maybe two or three of them, those mysteries of AI? Like that just sounds so cool. What are some of the mysteries of AI? Uh, let me pick a few. I, you know, we could, we could go on for a, lo for a long yes. time. On this one. one that we've heard a lot about this year is, is the problem of hallucinations. And this is when, you know, you talk to a model like Chad GPT and, and it makes up false information. Um, and so this is clearly a problem. Like we, you know, sometimes we want to go into fantasy land, but most of the time we want answers grounded in reality. Um, and so hallucination, you know, there's a few different ways to solve it. Uh, one way is to just make your models bigger and better. So give them, feed them more data. And as you feed them more data, they'll, they'll reduce the, the false information. Another way is to build the way that they generate the information differently. So right now, you know, they look at the, the past few sentences you said, and they, they generate the next few words, but, but they do it at a pretty shallow level. They don't look for logical consistency when they do that. And so we could build different architecture that give us much more robust logical consistency. Um, we could also leverage retrieval engines, for example. So if you take just a problem like hallucination, how to solve it, there's many different hypotheses and different approaches to solve that. So this is one example. You know, I could uh, pick a dozen more. An another one that we, we were working on quite a bit um, is the problem of um, building up uh, safety and alignment into our systems. So how do we make sure that the behavior of our system, and, and not just language, but systems that generate images or systems that generate sound and audio, how do we make sure that the output of these generative AI system is consistent with the behaviors that we want? Um, and, and so there's, there's, you know, first there's a question of like, what are the behaviors that we want? But then there's a the question of how do we put that in? Do we build it early on into the data? Do we build it into the architecture and the code itself? Do we sort of put it on the end, like a little bit of icing on the cake? Um, 
There's different approaches. So we take these canonical problems and we have different hypotheses. We build different systems. We run the experiment. And, and through that, we learned, we learned how to solve some of these interesting problems. That's, it's fascinating. I particularly like the hallucinations mystery and, and the way that you explained to our audience, you know, chat GPT is just predicting the next most likely word. And I don't think a lot of people realize that that is how that technology works. It's yeah. not about fundamentally understanding what is trying to be said and re-saying it. I know this because I was building that startup years ago. <laughs> um, years ago, I was in you know, like 2018, I was trying to say, okay, if we take these contract clauses, if it's trying to say this, how do we just rewrite it from like legalese to simple, easier to understand language, right? Yeah. And that requires understanding like what's being said, parts of speech, all that stuff. And that's not how these models work. These models are fascinating. They're very different. They almost... Yeah in a way, don't care the logic of what's being said. They're just like, next most likely word. This is what works. And for a legal contract in particular, you can imagine just the problems you get if you don't, if you don't uh, fix this problem. Exactly. So fascinating. So there you go. Some of our listeners, the mysteries of AI that you too could potentially solve. Um, all right. Moving more into AI research, obviously, you have an, an incredible background here, like the list of publications, just it scrolls and scrolls. It's amazing. I did not have the stamina for being a researcher, so I'm, I'm impressed. I've got my one paper master's and I'm out. Uh, so it's very, very impressive. I know how much work goes into that and, and I hope our users can really appreciate it. But, you know, talk to me more about reproducible research and like that, like research ethics and like checking it and tell me more. Yeah. And, um, you know, you talk about the, the publication. This is one part of our culture, especially in academic research, where we, you know, we communicate the results of our research through papers. And, and, and the reason I think, you know, papers are important is because they essentially give us a, a way to, to succinctly put together all of our findings. When we share it outside, we put it out for the scrutiny of the external world. We send it to peer review committees and, and other experts read our work and they send some critique and either they sort of give it a stamp of approval so it's going to be published in a conference or a journal, or they say, no, that's not quite good enough, you know, do some more work and send it again next time. Um, and, and all of that work, you know, you know, yes, over the years I've had the, the chance to, to write many papers, but, but it comes from work that I did with research teams, my research teams at McGill and at Mila and my research team uh, more recently at, at Meta. Science is really collaborative work. People forget that, but, but the way that we progress in our knowledge is through the work of a community of people. And, and so, you know, you mentioned a little bit the work I've done in reproducibility. That comes out of a deep sense that I want to make sure that when we share results, whether it's a paper or whether it's, you know, in some cases we open source our code or our models, I want to make sure that this is high quality work and reproducibility is one of the highest bar for, for the quality of the work. It, it's, it's a case where, you know, if I do a work in my lab and someone else takes information about that and re do, does the work in their own lab, that they reach the same results and they draw the same conclusions. And when we have reproducibility, we have higher confidence in the validity of our results and our research. So it's a fundamental tenet of science that reproducibility helps us build up the confidence in our results. It's not always easy to do. Sometimes one group comes out with the results and no one else can reproduce it. And, and we want to catch that very early because we are building as a community. So if you have that good result, other people will build on it. And if the foundations are weak down the line, your whole house will just like fall uh, on itself. So this is what we want to avoid. We want to build solid houses, high rise that will take us to, to really high quality results. But we need to have high standard of reproducibility. And in many times in my career, I've come across results from groups that did not meet that standard where people in my lab were not able to reproduce the work. And so we've put together uh, some, some um, initiatives to help to really drive home the importance of reproducibility and encourage the community to, to set a higher bar. We've set a reproducibility challenge where people are invited to reproduce work from other labs. We run this once a year with some of the top papers published in the year. We have set up a reproducibility checklist 
Um, it's a checklist, a bit like, you know, the pilots run in the plane where they kind of go through oh, all the yeah. items before they fly off. And, and, and the surgeons use this also, I'm told, in the operating room before you kind of cut open anyone. You like go through your checklist to make sure you've got all the all the pieces in place so that it goes well. So we proposed a reproducibility checklist that was used by many across the community. That is like a list of things that you can check to make sure that your paper, it increases the chance that the work is reproducible. It's not, you know, 100% guaranteed, but it certainly improves our ability to, to make sure to include all the ingredients that we need. And again, this is really driven from a point of view of helping us build a sound foundation for our knowledge um, so that not only can the research move faster, but also now we see a tons of people around the world who are building applications and products on our research. And if the research we give them isn't of the right quality, then the applications and the, the experiences that people are going to have with AI systems is not going to be up to our standards. That's incredible. It's, I loved the way that you talked about pilots and surgeons and gave those examples and saying, well, this is just as important, this repeatability checklist for AI research as well. I I couldn't agree more, obviously. Uh, it's something I've cared about for not quite as long as you, but it's amazing to see so many more people like waking up to like the power of AI now that we can start to see it and, and play with it. It feels real, but I mean, it's been coming for a long time. I know one of the journals you're um, on the board of, I believe was started in like the 1970s, something like that. Like a very, very long history getting us to this moment, which is such a big moment. And with all this talk of academic rigor, I do want to ask an interesting question of that transition from pure academia, right? Like working in, in McGill and Mila and then moving into being a researcher within the private sector. And I'd love to hear like the differences, the challenges, the opportunities, because it seems like you still keep an extremely high level of rigor. So what, what makes it different? Yeah, I, I, you know, when I finished my PhD in the early 2000s, I, I moved to, to McGill to start a faculty in my career, which I, I loved to this day. I, I love working with students, whether it's graduate students, whether it's in the classroom. I have, I have wonderful colleagues and I could easily have spent all of my career there. And yet there came a time where AI was really changing. AI as a field was, you know, you know, those of us who were in it, we sort of got you know, in hints that things are about to change and, and hints that some of the research was easier to do in industry, in particular building large models with larger teams, with more compute, more data. Um, and so the, the, the opportunity to join uh, FAIR really was driven again out of like a curiosity to see how can you do research in that setting, in that culture with those resources. Um, I was in incredibly fortunate that both Meta and McGill have agreed through the years to, to allow me to keep sort of a foot in both in both places with varying sort of level of responsibility and percentage of time. But through the years, both of them have been game to, to, to let me keep an affiliation uh, in each. And, and so on the Meta side, you know, one of the things that I've, I've discovered is the ability to work with bigger teams, the ability to have a close contact with some of the product teams who are deploying AI systems to billions of people. And, and so, you know, that, that responsibility of doing research of the highest quality, we, we feel it every day. It also comes with the ability to have access to, to more resources in terms of, of computation, GPUs, which are sort of the, the, the fuel to train these models. Um, and to have more senior research teams. Um, and so there's, there's some advantage in terms of really formulating a vision of AI for the future that comes with, with working the, with, those, with those collaborators and the, the amazing people that, that we have on the team. Um, and, and yet on the academic side, you know, we are doing research and so many of the new ideas come with the new generation. You know, you, you, you sort of carry the carry the field forward. And so for me, it's still a privilege to work with, with PhD masters and PhD students today um, because they inject such a new perspective on our work and, and they will lead us into the, the next few decades. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm incredibly lucky that I haven't had to choose um, between the two and, and that I can still benefit from both. And I, I see the complementarity of this. And I'm really glad, honestly, also that in Canada, we have much more of an, of an industry presence. When I came, to, you know, I did my master's and PhD in the U.S. I was in Pittsburgh at Carnegie Mellon University. 
when I finished that and I came back to, to Canada, the only option for someone who wanted to do research was u universities. There were no, there were or very, very few positions in industry. I'm, I'm really happy that we have so much more opportunities now. And I would say for, for many years at McGill, all of my PhD students, when they finished, all of them went abroad. They left Canada to start their career. Um, whereas in the last few years, I've seen a huge shift with many of them staying in Canada, um, especially to those that didn't go into academic roles, uh, staying in Canada to join either big companies or to join startups or just to do their own startup, um, a few of them here in Montreal. And so that's been wonderful to see that change and, and to see that you can do your research career from here. Um, I, I will set a more personal level. When I joined Meta, I was specifically to support the team in Montreal. But over the years, I've taken more responsibility. And now I support all of their AI research team um, across the board, uh, across the globe. I do it out of Montreal. Um, and, you know, with with video conference and, and all the other tools we have, I stay in close contact with the with the colleagues in, in California. And, and yet I'm able to do that from here. Wow. That's I mean. Wonderful that Canada is leading the way. And I, I do want to come back to FAIR in a minute because I know you're just past, I believe, six years. Um, years and for FAIR as an organization, we're, we're nearing our 10th anniversary. Yes, it was an article I pulled last year about five years with your involvement. So now six, but so six years with you and 10, 10 year anniversary is incredible. So I do want to come back to that. But you said a few things that are really important. They're often discussed with regards to research versus commercialization of AI in Canada, it comes up all the time. And you know, you've mentioned you're seeing that shift from these PhDs who used to always leave, and now at least some are staying. Um, and and this the fact that there even is the opportunity to do research in the private sector now, which you know, as you were saying, wasn't even a possibility before. Talk to me a little bit about what you're seeing, maybe the shifts in the trends around commercialization versus research in Canada? Because so often we still hear, so good at research, so good at research, so not so good at commercialization. So the question is, is that the right way to describe it? Is, is what we're being told the right narrative? And if it's not, what is reality? And if it is right, how do we have more commercialization? Yeah, I mean, one thing I can say for sure is there's been huge change you know, over the last uh, over the last uh, several years, um, I see many more big companies, big international companies, who are setting up uh, offices in in Canada, who have a footprint here. They come here because of the talent, um, and because they know that this is where they can work with some of the most talented researchers. And I'm seeing a lot of startups, uh, many more than I would have had before. There's you know a huge number of really exciting new ventures um, that are that are coming through and some of them are, are getting big I'm thinking of like you know Cohere who that's based in Toronto this is a great great example um, but there are many many more um, and the other thing we're seeing I, th I would say there's sort of three three patterns the third pattern we're seeing is well-established Canadian companies who are increasing their AI capacity so in-house you know th that are in all sorts of tech sectors, whether it's, you know, banking sector, whether it's transportation, uh, telecommunications or others, uh, and in-house, they are building up their capacity to, to develop uh, AI systems and to incorporate uh, AI into their, into their product, into their processes. Um, so I think those three things are happening, which creates a lot of, of capacity in terms of uh, for roles, interesting jobs for, for people with this type of expertise. Now, the question is more like, could we do more, right? I think we are doing a lot more today than we were before, which is incredibly exciting. Could we do more? Probably. Do we have enough injection of capital to make sure that these, you know, startups are growing? Do we have the right immigration policy to make sure that it's very easy for the talent to come in? And do we have the right incentives to enable uh, the existing companies to transform towards AI and to upskill their um, their employees, I think there is probably a lot more than we can do there. And then the last piece is is around the regulation. Um, I think we're in the process of figuring out how we will 
you know, build up a sound regulatory framework for AI. We are doing it in Canada. It's happening in the U.S. It's happening in the U.K. It's happening in the EU, across the world. Everyone's talking about area regulation. And, and there's a lot of um, questions about how that is going to, to, to come through. And I think it's important to be very, very thoughtful about how to build that in a way that really enables innovation, enables us to be very agile and to take the most of this incredible technology, but do it in a way that's responsible, do it in a way that is mindful of um, people's privacy, um, that does it in a way that really respects good principles in terms of fairness and security and so on and so forth. So that is going to be a really interesting question for coming months and years. I mean, you're so good at this. Uh, every time I want to talk about something, you just give me these Beautiful segues. So this is this is great. This is a great segue because I had seen something else in my pre-research on you online. And this is such a good segue. I saw the joint statement on AI safety and openness through Mozilla, which has 377 signatories at this time. It's pretty incredible. And if you look at it, you know, the open statement is the very first sentence is yes, openly available models come with risks and vulnerabilities. And then way at the end, it, it closes with. When it comes to AI safety and security, openness is an antidote, not a poison. And this seems to track with everything you've been saying about we, we do research, we put it out there for the scrutiny. That's on purpose. We want people to take it home, test it in their lab, and hopefully reproduce the same results, right? Um, and the privacy, responsibility, security, and fairness that you talk about within this, this new world of regulation. What are maybe two things that have you worried or just like you really want to make sure are like fundamentally included in whatever that regulation looks like, like two really important things. You're like, this regulation must have or not have these two things. Um, I can I can speak to a few, but it, it, and please, you know, take this with a grain of salt in that like my expertise is really in the AI research and, and you know, I'm not probably the, the, the best person to be <laughs> to be dictating regulation, what I do always appreciate is the conversation. And I think, you know, if we're going to make progress, we're going to have to get a broad set of stakeholders together to figure this out. So I would say there's a couple things that I've seen that, that we should be careful about. The, the, the first one is a lot of the regulation wants to have like a kind of a category of models that are like especially dangerous models. And, and they use different words. Sometimes they call them frontier models. Sometimes they call them high risk models. Sometimes they're like, you know, the boogeyman model that we're afraid of. Um, so the, the, the hesitation I have about that is I think it's going to be incredibly difficult to draw a line between like what models are on the dangerous side and what models are not on the dangerous side. And if anything, I have often seen cases where models that are less general, so what we'll call like narrow purpose models, models that do one thing, they're not like GPT that answers everything about everything you want to know. They're pretty narrow models they can be easier to weaponize. And by this, I mean someone can take the model and can transform it to, do, to create harm. Um, and so if smaller models are easier to weaponize, like the, this, this framing of frontier model just isn't going to be the right one. So I think that's one thing to really watch out for. Um, I'm not optimistic about the ability to really create a, a good category of, of, of dangerous models. Um, per se at the, at the model source. What I am more um, committed to is to try to have a, a, a productive conversation around what are the risks, what are the harms, and have kind of a risk-based risk -based approach. So I think that's one thing that you asked for too. I think the second one to be mindful of is, you know, the, there are undoubtedly many misuses that are possible with these models. And, and we have, we, we, we cannot put our head in the sand about that. We have to be very um, careful about um, defining what are those risks, defining what are the potential harms and so on. And so the other piece to keep an eye out is, is how are we gonna look at responsibility um, for these models? There's a temptation to say, you know, oh, the responsibility is all the way through the chain of and, and, and at sort of um, regulate at the source with the developers and the researchers. And, and I think that's going to be a, a difficult uh, value proposition. And, and I think we need to be much more mindful of 
um, looking at the the use cases. And, and, and the reason is not because I'm trying to get the researchers off the hook for responsibility. If anything, I push on my researchers every day to set a high bar for responsibility. The reason is because I think that when you're very early in the innovation cycle where, where most research happens, you have to set essentially like values. You have to think about what are the values that you want to bring into your system. But you're not really in a position to measure concrete risks and harms because you don't know the full set of use cases of this technology. And so I'm not saying you put your technology out there, wash your hand of any responsibility. Your responsibility is to be transparent. Your responsibility is to propose new solutions that address known, known harms. But it's not necessarily feasible to prevent sort of cut all risks at the source. And so we have to be really thoughtful about forming the whole development cycle. But with respect to regulation, I think it's more promising to focus at, um, at the, the, in the use case where you can identify specific risks. You can build mitigations. You can look at the effectiveness of these mitigations. You can look at responsibility and so on and so forth. Yeah, this is great. Thanks for like playing in the sandbox with me on regulation because it's it's a very, you know, top of mind item for many folks. And to your point, we need to hear from everyone. You're, you're maybe not a policymaker, but you do have a lot of knowledge uh, to provide. So thanks for joining me in that little detour for a moment. Um, but back to FAIR. So celebrating your six years and their 10 year anniversary overall. Yes. You know, one of the fundamental values is openness, which you talked about. You need to have values as like a great way to prevent any of uh, pre-prevent in as much as you can some of these other challenges. Uh, talk more about you know your commitment to this open science and like what you're really excited about the next ten years for Fair. Mm -hmm. I have to say that the culture of openness is what really drew me in to to Fair because I think it was a pretty unique across the across the ecosystem of a large industry lab that was willing to commit to to such a degree to open science. Um, and so the, the culture was already there before I joined. And it's a large part of, of why I joined, set in place by my colleague, Jan LeCun, but as well supported by the, the leadership of the company at the highest level. Um, and, and through the years, I think we've, we've built up the muscle to, to keep on doing this. And, and what that means concretely, it means, you know, for all of our researchers, when we start most of our research project, we have an intent to share openly the results of our work at some point down the line. And the result can take different forms. It can be a research paper. It can be a code. It can be a trained model. It can be a data set. It can be a demo. We talk about research artifacts. And so each of these artifacts is a way to showcase the research work. And sometimes we release all these artifacts. Sometimes we release just one or two of them. Recently, we've added more such as model cards. So it's become best practice when we release a model to have a model card that explains in reasonably, you know, layman's term, what, what goes on in the, in the model. Um, we've experimented with releasing responsible use guides with some of our models that come with um, more, more permissive license. And, and in some cases, you know, models that could be used by other people to, to build new products. We, we include a responsible use guide. Um, I, I think we've sort of evolved the the process and and the practices around this, but but this commitment to openness has persisted. Now I have to be honest about one thing: you know, openness and transparency are sort of one value, but but there's other values that that we also uphold. In fact, we we talk internally. I'm going to share information about our fresco of values, and so we have sort of six values: you know, freedom, responsibility, excellence, scale, collaboration, and openness. So it's six of them. It's our fresco. What's interesting is sometimes, and this is not unusual, some of these values are in tension with each other. And so sometimes, yes, we want to be open, but we also want to be responsible. And we also want to produce work that is of an excellent quality. And so there are projects at times where the value of openness is in tension with one of our other values. And so we may decide not to release some work. For example, if a model doesn't release our standard of quality, then, you know, we're not meeting our bar in terms of excellence. We're not going to go and open up that model. Or if we feel like the model isn't um, meeting a high standard of responsibility, for example, if it's not built from data that we think should be made public, we're not going to release that model. So I just, 
it just to want to, you know, to maybe to demystify a little bit what goes on behind the scenes in terms of how to think of openness and responsibility. It's, it's not something to push for in the absolute. It, 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 and transparency can help build trust in our innovation. Transparency can help accelerate the pace of innovation. But there are other things we care about also. And, and sometimes these things are intention and we need to figure out how to navigate it. I love that. Oh. oh, it's just, it's wonderful to have that nuance, which is often being diluted down in many other aspects of society. And so trust the researchers and academics among us to be like, well, here is the specific nuance. We care about this and these six things and acknowledging that tension. That is a very good example that you were providing for our listeners. And I super appreciate that. Um, so as we, we're really in the back end of this this interview now, and maybe a couple questions on the Canadian AI ecosystem a little bit more, and then of, of course I'm going to ask you for your final final takeaways. But you know something that's also a hot button issue in AI, and certainly I experienced in my 20s as a young woman founder of an AI company before it was cool. Uh, you know, is like diversity. You know, people, location experience, perspectives, like all those different elements. And, you know, there's many folks in the AI space who are really talking about it. But the Canadian lens, you know, what's your Canadian lens on diversity and its importance in AI research? Because a lot of the people talking about it are, are, are stateside. So talk to me yeah, more. About uh, I mean, I, you know, I've, I, I've grown up sort of a, <laughs> um, across, you know, in Ottawa, the intersection of <laughs> the, both the Francophone and the Anglophone <laughs> culture. And and I've had the the, the privilege to, to travel in many, many places uh, around the world and to work with researchers who come from many places around the world. Back in the days of my PhDs, you know, my, my friends and classmates came from, from China, from India, from Israel. They came from Europe. They came from South Africa. Uh, and and that was a, a wonderful way to to see the world through through completely different lenses. Um, I do think it's incredibly important to build diverse team because... You know, often what I've always said, and, and this is also partly from my own, you know, journey as a woman in, in, in research and science, it's so much that you, you solve problems differently. You know, we all know the same math and the same science and, and, and we all code with the same language and so on. What we do is we ask different questions. And when you come to the table with your own experience and your own background, you will ask different questions. And as a result, you will take the work on a different journey. And so this is what's really, really, you know, I think the, the fundamental value of doing that. I, I strive to build very diverse teams um, and we've developed several, several ways to do it. Um, I, I think it's important from a sense of equity, but I, I deeply believe and I've seen so many times that it makes our work better. Um, and, and specifically for AI, which is it's not a technology like like any other. It's a technology that is going to impact all of the world. Um, it's incredibly important. One of the areas where FAIR has done the most work is actually in machine translation. So the ability to build AI system that translate from one language to another. And, you know, this has been open problem for many years. Um, but we've been really pushing the the state of the art in terms of, you know, building system that translate not just to like a dozen language, but, you know, to up to 200 languages in some cases, a special effort with rare uh, languages for which we don't have a lot of um, resources. And so we have to create partnerships with communities across the world to figure out what is the right uh, set of data. In some cases, these conversations bring us into, you know, you know, deep reflection about the role that AI is having in these communities. Um, if you look at the Maoris, for example, in New Zealand, they've taken a very strong stance about owning their data and, and, and having really autonomy in deciding when they participate or not into AI research project. We try to engage in that conversation with these communities to respect their wishes and, and, and their own journey um, with, with technology, which is often influenced by a, a, the colonial past um, that comes in their own uh, in their own communities and history. So it's just and kind of one nutshell of you know <laughs> where it shows up in a really meaningful way in our work. And if I can just jump in for a second there on the machine machine translation piece, I would actually um, met someone um, two years ago now 
from one of the Facebook research teams, and now I'm really regretting that I didn't pull their name. It just came to me right now. Um, who was saying that this machine translation work you're using, and specifically we were saying about unknown languages, is being used for preserving even Canadian indigenous languages mm -hmm. where there are very, very few speakers. So it's something like magical and amazing to think of like the tremendous benefits of AI in, mm -hmm. in having languages that have very, very sp few speakers globally being yeah. preserved. Yes, I think the potential is huge. But like, uh, I'll be honest with you, in some cases, we've had conversation, in, including with some of the communities in Canada, and they've shared back that they don't want to participate. They don't want to, you know, bring their their knowledge to this. They have, for, for, for many reasons, you know, um, as concerns about the fact that uh, groups, research groups may exploit uh, their data, their culture for, for, um, for purposes that don't, don't meet their own values. And and as much as possible, I, I really do try to respect the, the wishes of the community and to engage. It, it's a long process. And because they don't want to participate today doesn't mean they won't participate down the line. But I think we also have to be very mindful when we engage in this work to give a voice to these communities and, and how we build that technology. So it goes back to this question of diversity, right? They don't have to be in my team for me to listen to them and, and, and be influenced by them and, and engage with them. And the work on machine translation is where We've been um, most, most exposed to that. But it's so important because it gives people the ability, as you mentioned, to preserve their language and their culture. It gives their ability to communicate, sometimes across generations. Um, so there's, there's amazing potential, but we have to take the time to do it, right? Absolutely. And yeah, I, you can see the care and consideration that you have, which I, I super admire and appreciate seeing. I, I want to ask you your last uh, nuggets for folks. So while you're thinking of the last nuggets you want to share, I'm also just tossing out like, you know, what does it look like in the world if we offer these communities the tooling and maybe have like independent systems that they can own to train their own AIs and they can own this AI that maintains their language? That's like one thought I had when you were talking. And another thought was something I had actually wanted to do years ago um, with my company, had we been able to scale it, was having data sets natively in other languages, like not in just English. Because I had heard from someone that there are certain speech language things where you'll speak to in a different language, it'll convert it to English and then bring it, you know, go find the answer on the web and then bring it back and speak to you in that language. And to me, it's just like, if, if all of our AI systems are only built in English, that is a huge diversity problem. Like look at how many Spanish speakers there are globally. Like what? Eat Mandarin, Cantonese, like it's just, Mm -hmm. Come on now, like Hindi. So for me, I, I'm very passionate about that. And, you know, when you're talking about machine translation and languages and diversity, those are two things that come to mind. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you have a, a quick comment on the... Well, from machine translation, I am, I'm happy to reassure you, you, we've sort of gotten past that phase and that, you know, you're right for many, many years. Like if you want to go from just French to Spanish, which are like sister languages, you had to go from French to English and English to Spanish. Um, and, and all of sort of the, the, the cultural constraint you get from the, the, the lovely Anglo-Saxon language um, may, may miss some of the, the passion and the heat for that. You get to keep it between French and Spanish. So we've gone past that, you know, our, our work on what we call no language left behind, which is a system we, we shared um, a couple of years ago, um, really look at language families. And it builds the machine translation around families of languages uh, which have similar roots and so on. And so I think we have we have better solutions now, though, though uh, so much of the, the information that we use, most of which is from the web, is still in English. So I think there's so much more we can do to build uh, systems that that are much more sort of influenced by other languages and cultures. Absolutely. Yeah, it's just it's just a huge gap that I see. All right. What is your final like words of wisdom, takeaways on all of this that you would want to leave our listeners with? I, I want to talk. There, there's like one last piece of AI that we haven't talked about that I'm super excited about. And and I, 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 I'm throwing it out there as sort of, you know, by <laughs> the bottles in the sea, um, which is one of the areas that we don't talk nearly enough, but I think it's going to be completely transformational is the use of AI in scientific discovery. We have the potential to use AI to discover new molecules, new proteins, new materials that are completely gonna change um, science and, and 
in society. Um, I have, you know, seen colleagues who are working on new materials that are better able to preserve energy, new batteries. I've seen colleagues work on new molecules to cure cancer. I've seen new colleagues try to figure out, you know, how to um, essentially, you know, solve processes in chemistry through AI. And so the space is huge. And so I just want to put it out there that in many ways, you know, the models that we are developing for AI, we think they're just going to, you know, enhance our, our, our web experience and, and so on and so forth. But the ability to take these ideas and implement them in the scientific discovery process for all the other sciences is incredible. And, and so, you know, even in the, in the toughest days and, and, and when I feel like, oh, are we really bringing like, you know, good into the world with this new technology? The work that I'm seeing that is happening in the basic sciences coming from AI and our ability to accelerate the scientific discovery progress is incredible. I've had a colleague tell me recently there, I'm not going to reveal the results of their work because it's not quite ready for publication yet, but they're engaged in, in, in one of these projects on, on AI guided design. And, and what they said is, Joel, you know, over the last six months, we have done as much project progress as we plan to do in 25 years with our classical methods. And the reason is they could use AI to essentially rank the hypotheses from the most promising to the least promising. And instead of going in the lab and trying out like, you know, thousands of different combinations, they just went through the first top 10 combinations and they found something promising. It's not confirmed. It will come out. But, but this kind of thing is going to happen over and over in the next few decades. And I think it's going to be incredibly exciting to follow that. So what you're saying is for the next revolutions in other forms of science, it's not going to be a thousand attempts to make the light bulb. We might be able to get that down to 10 attempts to get the light bulb <laughs> of and the future. One and it will... <laughs> Hopefully, wow. hopefully solve many of many important open problems for us. Wow. I mean, I love the space. I'm obsessed with it, obviously. Um, it's really wonderful to spend time with you. Uh, Joelle Pinot, thank you so much for being with us. And I want to say Dr. Joelle Pinot, because, you know, you should be getting all your laurels. Uh, really nuanced and important conversation. Thank you for sharing so generously today with our listeners. Wonderful to have you here. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for the conversation. What a wonderful, wonderful episode. Thank you for sharing the two mysteries of AI on the hallucinations when it makes things up and how we need to improve safety with guardrails and better safeguards around what AI can and cannot do. I also loved her talk about in-house AI capacity growing within major organizations and the tremendous opportunity for folks to work in banks, in finance, in transportation, in government, in all these other industries on AI inside those organizations. And she entertained me by uh, dealing with a tricky question on regulation, which I so appreciated that we actually discussed and, and offered two really important sticking points that need to be considered in this world of AI regulation. So thank you again so very much, Dr. Joelle Pinot, and I hope you all enjoyed this episode. Thanks for listening to this Ask AI podcast. This episode was edited by James Fajardo. Original music was provided by Mike Letourneau. The series producer was Chris McClellan. To view the episode transcript, stream the video version, and get helpful links, check out the episode post in the Ask AI blog.